This conference will now be recorded. And get ahead of the type of situations depicted on my cover slide of the presentation. Uh, over the next five minutes, I would like to focus on flood preparedness solutions that are readily available and can be deployed by homeowners, communities, and business owners to get ahead of the floods that are coming. So uh, the focus of my presentation will be on really outlining the most practical solutions that are already available at hand that can be leveraged um, by homeowners, uh, communities, and businesses today. What you see depicted on this slide, slide two, is just examples of guidance that was uh, prepared by the Intex Center on Climate Adaptation out of University of Waterloo with support of um, our partners, National Research Council of Canada, Standards Council of Canada, and approximately 100 national experts on flood preparedness uh, in Canada. But I believe that this type of guidance is uh, transferable and could be useful in the US as well. Um, I will do a deep dive on uh, key points from these various guidance documents that I think will be useful to consider as we prepare for um, floods that are coming in light of COVID-19 situation. And I would like to start with uh, what homeowners can do to better prepare for flooding and uh, to point out a few findings that uh, the Intex Center has to share after serving approximately 500 Canadians on typical things that cause uh, flooding at the level of a property that could be remediated quite easily. And uh, after serving these 500 people, what we found out was that the typical things that go wrong outside of the house it is um, downspout and sump pump discharge very close to the house, uh, grading around the house may direct water actually towards the house when it rains as opposed to towards the street and the right of way. Uh, again, these are highly remediable problems to have outside of the house um, by homeowners themselves, perhaps not even having to invest too much money into the rem remediation of these issues. Inside the house, when we surveyed homeowners, we also found out that uh, frequently uh, homeowners that had sump pumps to help keep their foundation dry at the time of flood, they wouldn't have backup power on the sump pump, which is quite critical because frequently during flooding, we are also experiencing power outages. So having a backup power on a sump pump is a, is a good idea. We also saw many folks uh, store furniture or electronics, valuables, right on the basement floor, as opposed to perhaps moving these uh, items up or storing in plastic sealable containers to help reduce damages if the water does get inside the basement. So again, these are highly remediatable issues uh, that would take just a couple of hours on the weekend to fix and can reduce um, significant heartache uh, many times if, uh, if the water were to get into the basement. And lastly, um, one of the common issues we also uncovered that homeowners may not know where the water, uh, the floor drain is located in the basement that may be covered by a carpet or uh, obstructed by a few boxes. So making sure that uh, the floor drain is unobstructed if the water were to get in the house is also a good idea. And then in terms of maintenance, um, we noted that frequently homeowners may have had installed backwater valve uh, to reduce the risk of uh, sanitary sewer surcharge. Um, they may have a sump pump, uh, but they may not be testing these features to make sure that they're working at the time when it's needed the most. And so address um, these common uh, maintenance uh, issues that exacerbate flooding or damages um, at the level of a home, we've created this very simple infographic that I hope uh, you see displayed on the screen that can be literally printed out, uh, posted on the fridge uh, as sort of homework for um, various homeowners to do this long weekend to uh, better maintain their home and reduce the risk of flooding. And uh, for those people who are more friendly with technology, there's also an app that is available that you can download and it takes you approximately 10 minutes to walk inside your house, outside of the house, uh, observe uh, various uh, maintenance homeworks that you may uh, need to do 
and uh, after completing this home flood risk assessment you can uh, print out particular homework for your house uh, that you can uh, engage in uh, to, to minimize uh, flood risk for your particular property. So that would be the customized home flood risk assessment based on the common um, vulnerabilities uh, for a typical house. Uh, I would also like to note uh, some examples from commercial real estate buildings uh, that we've observed in the past where their property managers and owners have invested into flood preparedness and uh, that may be offering some lessons learned uh, to both other office towers but also to multi-unit residential buildings and here you see an example with some pictures i took after visiting a trio vest site in calgary following a massive 2013 flood that we had there um, few years back and so this is an example of one building owner and manager that has now created a flood room that's equipped with uh, emergency flood supplies including emergency lighting generation equipment portable flood barrier that they can access around five city blocks under one hour uh, to protect uh, their buildings from flooding so if you're a tenant in an office tower, well, now you're working from home, but if you're a tenant in a multi-unit residential building, you would probably feel a lot safer if you know that your property management team has prepared for the floods that are coming uh, and, and there are examples of that taking place already. Um, so to conclude, and I'm happy to answer more questions, there is flooding is real, it's happening. We'll, we know that we will have an issue with it this spring. Um, there are practical means to address um, and improve flood resilience, such as the ones that I referenced above. And I think the main point to drive home is the time is now to get ahead of the storm. And we can start with very practical actions right at the level of a home um, to get ready. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. And. Uh Somebody asked earlier if all of the slides will be available. We will send you a link to where you can find them all. Um, and if you need them via email, we can also provide them that way. Um, Natalia Mudrak, just so you all know, is from the Intact Center in Toronto. Uh, she does a lot of work on flood mitigation throughout North America. And next in our panel, we have Roderick Scott, Flood Mitigation Industry Association. He is someone who has an expertise on raising houses and on helping people figure out how to pay for and assess whether or not moving a house or mitigating in certain aspects is the right fit for him. Rod, I'm going to turn it over to you. Rod, you are presenter, but you have to unmute yourself. Here we go. Okay. And you all can see my screen now? Yes. Unfortunately, I took it out of, hang on just a second. Okay, now we're set up again, and you can hear me, right? Thank you. Uh, yeah, Sorry about but that. You're, you're still in the uh, two-screen mode, so yep. All right, let's flip that real quick. How's that? Yes, you got it. Great. Okay. Sorry about the slow start here. Um, thank you for having uh, the Flood Mitigation Industry Association myself present today. Uh, it is quite an honor. Uh, there's a lot of organization going on up around the Great Lakes and we have a lot of flooding issues up there on both sides uh, between the US and, the, and Canada. Um, the flood mitigation industry basically was uh, begun over about a three year period, finally incorporated last year uh, to provide a voice for this relatively small but rapidly growing industry of uh, product manufacturers, sales and distribution, engineers, architects, contractors and specialists like me that consult into the industry. Um, we are uh, concerned about the uh, flooding increase uh, worldwide uh, that is being exacerbated by the changes in our climate. Um, 
it's uh, flooding damages buildings and property. And uh, one of the sayings that we have is flooded buildings don't have to happen. Flooding is going to happen, but flooded buildings don't have to happen. So whether it's through site protection, barriers uh, on the buildings, dry flood proofing techniques, uh, uh, or elevating of structures or relocating of structures, um, we can adapt to this changing environment and increase in flood, but it's going to take adaptation to do it. And so um, this presentation is briefly just showing you a brief window into structure elevation and uh, the many benefits of that. In the American, on the American side, uh, we have uh, a national flood insurance program which was started about 50 years ago um, because private insurance was no longer covering buildings ever since the great floods of 1927 in America. And we built like crazy at the coast after World War II. So we had to protect those mortgages and the properties. So we created this federally backed flood insurance program. Uh, we're now seeing kind of a rise in the, in the private sector side. But in reality, we have millions of older buildings that were built before the first flood maps and flood program came out, flood insurance program. And so we are extremely vulnerable in our buildings because they weren't built to the proper elevation or flood proofed from the beginning. So uh, what they're doing now, it, well, for 50 years, the flood insurance in America was subsidized at very, very low rates for the buildings. That is all going away now. It started in 2012, modified in 2014. We're about halfway through this process. And on this screen, you can see the residential rates for flood insurance on these high flood risk buildings. And if you're four feet below the map elevation, you have a $250,000 maximum policy from the NFIP, you will be paying $9,500 a year when this is all over. Uh, the increases are over. Um, it, it basically modifying and adapting the buildings makes economic sense uh, once you get into these uh, higher, much higher insurance rates. And private flood is going to price their products um, similarly. We're, we're not going to see very low rates from private flood insurance, whether either side of the border. Um, normal private flood insurance is a business and their motto, their, their operandi, modus operandi is, is to make money. And so they're going to charge high rates for private flood as well. So really, we're faced with this whole new horizon of experience. And many of our people that own these buildings in these coastal environments or riverine environments are further along in life, like myself. I'm a grandfather now, 63. Our houses are paid off. We hope to hand these houses maybe to our children, just as our parents handed them to us. Uh, but we're going to have to reinvest in them because these high insurance rates are going to lower the values of the properties, which is not what we want to have happen. So uh, like it or not, we have to reinvest in these properties or we have to decide that we're going to sell these properties and get out before the values start going down. And those are all financial decisions that individual families and individuals will have to make. But you can see that basically on the far right, if you build above the minimum flood map elevation requirements, your insurance will be very, very low. And the savings compared to not doing anything can virtually pay off these projects. Um, we have some federal grant programs in America that are very, very small in comparison to the need. I mentioned three to four million buildings in America. The problem is most communities haven't inventoried these buildings, don't know the values of the property and or the property taxes. Remember, property taxes make the world go round. They pay for our schools, they pay for roads, fire, critical infrastructure, and they help pay back the revenue bonding that our communities are all going to have to enter into to build our more resilient infrastructure, whether it be the uh, water treatment plants, the roads, uh, the flood protection systems along the rivers. That all usually has to be borrowed money from the marketplace. And uh, if we're reducing the revenues coming into the governments from these high insurance rates, lowering our values, none of that's going to work either. So a lot of challenges ahead for this generation, my children's generation, and certainly my grandchildren's generation. And we have to adapt or we lose. So these are the rates that are coming with the National Flood Insurance Program. I can guarantee you that the private flood is probably going to be priced similarly 
for structures that are very low and high flood risk. Uh, this is an interesting slide that was developed actually by a floodplain manager in Michigan, um, wonderful friend uh, in the business of the floodplain administration, and basically took a lot of the discussions that we had together and put them into a um, graphic illustration that kind of talks about who pays to mitigate these structures and what the benefits are. Um, I remind people that when we elevate buildings, every trade works. So it's a, really a job creation program. We're looking at $600 billion in the next 20 years of retrofit modifications to buildings in the, America. And because of the smaller populations and less property, uh, we really haven't tried to estimate what that looks like in Canada yet. But um, we have to mitigate these buildings. You can't keep flooding buildings because then people can't stay in those buildings and they lose their property, walk away, give it up, and it doesn't benefit to society at all. So we must become resilient to flooding. So elevation benefits us by lowering the flood risk on the structures. Uh, in my community, I've had four, in 14 years since Katrina, including Katrina, we've had nine hurricane surges across from New Orleans with no levees. So we have a five foot seawall and basically it's been over that seawall in a big way in nine, nine times. And my community is now 80% elevated off the ground. So all we have is 10 or 12 buildings left where we have to help the people pull their belongings out, gut those lower flood damaged areas and rebuild again. It makes no sense to keep doing this again and again and again. We have to adapt. Lowers the flood insurance premiums because our risk is lower. It preserves the property values from the declines in the increasing flood insurance values. It preserves, and, and also in my community, now that we're over that bell curve of halfway of the structures being mitigated, the older historic buildings actually sell for more than their listing price. People are bidding them up. Uh, which is um, wonderful for the owners and um, shows the value of this process. We preserve our property taxes for our schools and government funding. And now in the era of CB19, with everything shut down economically, uh, and we're going to come back to a whole new economy uh, when we do open up again, um, we've lost all those sales taxes that are so important for these local budgets. So our property taxes are even more important in the next coming years as the economy tries to rebuild itself. Creates work for design professionals. Our structural engineers and architects are engaged with producing um, required compliant designs as well as aesthetic designs. We don't have to make these projects just an engineering solution. God bless my engineers, love them, work with many of them, but we need to incorporate good design into the retrofit of these older buildings. It also creates good construction sector jobs in all the trades, as I said before, and we hire local people. The elevation companies may come in from other areas because that's specialized, but all the rest of the process is local construction, local trades, and local materials purchases, concrete, bricks, wood, um, our electricians, our plumbers are all locally based. And so it, it's, a, it's a good process and it's worked in all the communities that we've elevated. Um, I've done about 1500, uh, many in other states in the country. This is a program, this next slide or last slide that I have is basically a how to get started for the property owners. This is not an easy process to understand. Um, uh, it requires planning and often takes a couple of years, multiple years to get the uh, project into a position of actually starting, uh, whether it be grants or financing. Um, so basically this uh, flyer that I helped the International Association of Structural Movers, we've got a lot of great structural movers um, uh, in Canada. Uh, and we want to put them to work and keep them working, helping adapt our communities to increase in flood risk. Uh, so basically on the front side here is an illustration of uh, why, what the benefits are down with these little icons. And, and uh, so we don't have to tear down houses and put them in the dump uh, like uh, some people promote. We can actually elevate them, save the resources, 
Uh, I don't know if you all know, but it's very green to elevate and, and do this because uh, every thousand square foot of wood frame house has approximately 200 plus trees in it. Why would we throw a perfectly good house into the landfill? Uh, let's let's just preserve the houses. It's going to flood. It floods underneath the house. You clean up and you go back to living. Um, so on the back side of this flyer is this are the steps to do every single elevation project. Every house is different, but the steps are the same. And so we empower uh, our industry believes in the three E's: educate. Uh, well, first, empathize, because none of this is easy for anyone that owns property that's in flood risk or has been flooded. Uh, I've been through probably 20 national disasters. It's a very rugged environment with a lot of pain and heartache. Um, but then we educate them on this process, and then we empower them to move forward, getting those steps done to getting towards the project. We also encourage governments to uh, and banks to uh, find financing vehicles for this process because um, in America, the banks believe they're holding about a trillion and a half dollars of bad paper right now on mortgages that the insurance is going up and the values are starting to come down. So it's the reality of where climate change and increasing weather events and flooding is hitting the road is the values of our structures. So we must be strong and we must adapt and we're not going to lose. So I just want to thank you all for joining our presentation today. Uh, this is just a tiny snippet of what's available out there and um, on this information. And here's the uh, URL for that flyer. We encourage you all in your organizations to share that flyer. Not every structure needs to be elevated. Um, some structures can be dry flood proofed or uh, perimeter flood proofed. Uh, it just depends on the country that you're in and the regulations and the benefits of those processes. But elevation is one form of flood hazard mitigation for our buildings. So thank you very much for having me. Thanks, Rod Scott there. We now want to go to Brian Desset. He is the city manager for South Haven, Michigan, which is a community that is on the water uh, on the west side of Michigan, of uh, the state of Michigan. And we're going to get from him a perspective on how um, municipalities are navigating the intersection between flooding and also dealing with COVID-19. We wanted to get um, him to talk about that, and he'll be followed by George Pastito of the Wayne County Disaster Preparedness. We also, I believe, have Diane Devlin from Wayne County, New York, Director of Public Health on the line. But first, let's go to Brian. Brian, I think you've got your slides ready. You can go ahead. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Desets. I work for the city of South Haven. South Haven is uh, located in Southwest Michigan. We're about three and a half square miles. Uh, we are very much a, uh, a town that embraces tourism. During the winter, we've got about 4,000 people. And during the summer, we'll jump to about 10,000 or more. This is a quick aerial image. Um, the city is divided by what's the, the Black River. It flows into Lake Michigan. Uh, we have a north side and south side. And I'm going to move quite quickly. So if there are questions, I'll happily follow up. Coastal erosion in our little three and a half square mile town uh, has an estimated uh, financial cost of between 500,000 and up to $2 million. It's impacting our seven public bathing beaches and a variety of right-of-ways adjacent to uh, Lake Michigan. Here are some images that were captured over the last 12 months, just showing some of the effects of, uh, of the rising waters in both the Black River and Lake Michigan. Continued images of just, this is our everyday reality. And this continued uh, what we're doing to try and combat some of uh, the situations. Riverbank erosion is just as expensive as it is along uh, Lake Michigan. So our Black River, um, between 500,000 and up to $2 million uh, to continue to combat the high uh, water in the Black River. The city has since uh, 1969 run a variety of public marinas. Uh, we have a total of four municipal marinas. And uh, what you're looking at in these slides are images of the impacts on uh, two of the four municipal marinas. 
what you can see here is as the uh, the waters in the Black River continue to rise, they're now uh, getting actually behind the seawalls that uh, support these structures, causing sidewalks to collapse, causing some of the um, the walls to collapse. And this marina that we're currently looking at, this would be kind of uh, the city's crown jewel. It's referred to as our North Marina. And unfortunately for uh, this summer, for the summer of 2020, this marina will be closed to allow us uh, to pursue emergency repairs. This is some of the work that we were doing in 2019 to try and keep up with the rising waters, um, essentially tearing out the walls, uh, backfilling, um, repairing some of the seawalls. And even with this work in 2019, um, the North Marina is unsafe for the, the public to be at for the, the summer of 2020. One concept that the city is actively pushing is a harbor wave mitigation plan. This will require cooperation through the federal government. Um, back in 2018, we worked with the state of Michigan to develop a wave mitigation study. And that study, uh, the, the main recommendation was a modification that you can see here. It's a proposed structure to modify the, uh, the piers on both the city's north and south side. Um, essentially uh, to try and absorb some of the wave action as it flows from Lake Michigan into the Black River. Beach nourishment is a major concern. Our, uh, our, our seven public bathing beaches are, are, are largely gone. This is an image that was just taken a couple of months ago and um, you can see uh, this was the beach just two years ago and now it's largely underwater. We have been in regular contact with the Army Corps of Engineers hoping to see nourishment um reinstated the last time the city saw major nourishment was approximately 1986. continued images just showing the the new reality of of the lakeshore one of uh, the main uh, thoroughfares on the city south side is monroe boulevard we are taking steps to implement a plan that we've worked on over the last two years to try and um create some erosion controls along the, the roadway, and then uh, begin using a, a variety of, of almost covert um, um, retaining walls mixed with a variety of native plants. Over onto the city's uh, North Beach, you can see in the lower left is 2012, and in the, the lower right is 2019. And you can just see how much uh, sand and, and beach area we've lost. Jumping to uh, the city's marinas, um, the, the, the costs are just stacking. The, uh, the, the reality for the city of South Haven is that uh, the marina business is something that we've been in since the late 60s. It's been um, a good business for the city to be in. Each year, the marina revenues, a portion of those go back into the city's general operating, and it's helped to fund police, fire, and other uh, essential services. This is once again the new normal. So this was taken this winter and uh, the docks are largely submerged. And uh, the main concern for us is uh, the, the potential for electrocution. At each dock, we've got a conduit run to the, uh, the individual docks. Uh, these docks are then equipped with shore power. Unfortunately, um, we've had a variety of electrical engineers working with us and we're able to, to show that we have straight current flowing out into the river. Due to the stray current, it's just unsafe and we've shut down power to these docks. And continued images just showing how, how high the water has gotten. And here's an image, uh, lower middle, you can see some of that conduit that uh, is the electrical conduit that's largely flooded. Along the, uh, the lake shore, we have a variety of storm drain outlets that uh, have just taken a massive beating. Uh, we've started some of uh, those storm drain repairs, but uh, in total, we estimate about $500,000 worth of work is needed. This is the city's wastewater treatment plant. We provide sewer services for the surrounding townships. Um, our utilities um, from our little three and a half square mile town stretch out to about 20 square miles. This is our sewer plant, and this is our top priority as far as critical infrastructure. With the, the rising water levels, uh, the sewer plant is now regularly inundated with, uh, with overflowing uh, storm water. 
This is a, an image of the uh, the sewer plant, and we are currently working with the Army Corps of Engineers to begin assembling a variety of HESCO dams uh, to bolster some of uh, the flood points that are inundating the, uh, the sewer plant. Here are images that were taken just a few months ago that show the waters flowing into the sewer plant. Uh, these areas should be dry. These areas are actually lawns. And um, you can see the office uh, where the, uh, the the plant lab services are kept. Uh, literally, they're they're walking through ankle deep water every day to get in. Quick images of uh, the city staff trying to build flood controls around lift stations. This image is of uh, the city's South Beach, and um, here is our water filtration plant. The water filtration plant um, was built um, less than 10 years ago with active consideration about uh, 100 year flood levels. Um, the thing that we're running into now is not the filtration plant that is, is flooding, it's the underground storage tanks that are approximately here. We've got about a million dollars, or I'm sorry, about a million gallons worth of drinking water that's stored under the beach. And as Lake Michigan water levels get closer and closer to that area, we're getting more and more concerned about undermining of, of that uh, storage tank. This is a quick shot of, of what we're planning to do to armor this area to try and combat some of uh, the high water and high wave action. And this is just a quick shot of what the South Beach looks like today. Uh, less than 10 years ago, there was probably another 150 feet of beach uh, from, from these viewing areas. Flooding along uh, major streets is very common now. Uh, we estimate about a million dollars worth of uh, flood control work that is needed for, for basic uh, maintenance of city streets. Our, uh, our past mayor actually lived right along this street. Um, and uh, he and I were joking that uh, he was no longer going to be assessed for his riverfront property. He was now going to be assessed as an island because he had the river on both sides of his home. This is another example of uh, flooding along uh, one of our uh, city streets. Uh, we actually get a, a geyser occurring in the, uh, the storm drain at the end of North Shore Drive. Uh, water being pushed through the, uh, the pier structure is, is geysering up out of the storm drain into the street. We have uh, dams that are going into place, a mix of HESCOs and uh, Tiger dams are being placed throughout the, uh, the community. Our community, uh, once again, is uh, separated as a north and south side, um, and our main thoroughfare is this Baskill Bridge. The uh, Baskill Bridge is was made, received roughly $3 million worth of maintenance just a couple of years to upgrade uh, electronics and hydraulics. Unfortunately, uh, with the continued high water levels, uh, maintenance on the bridge is once again needed. Uh, we'll have to raise some of uh, the electrical controls to keep them from being flooded out. Interesting on this is the water level is now so high that even very small uh, watercraft, uh, we're having to raise the bridge to allow boats to go through. There's roughly, I wanna say roughly a thousand slips within our harbor, and I would say probably close to 60% of those are having to wait for this bridge to go up and down to allow them to access to Lake Michigan. And I don't know if you can see this image, but uh, that sign actually says danger and it's largely submerged. So for the city of South Haven, uh, we are a small town. Our, our total budget on an annual basis is about $40 million. And that includes our, our marinas, our water sewer, our electric funds and everything else. If we were to fix everything that we're facing right now tied to uh, Lake Michigan and the Black River water levels, we could easily spend $20 million. Um, that is just a, a crippling number for the city of South Haven. And over the last several months, we've been working in an outreach mode to try and get both the state of Michigan's attention as well as the federal government's attention. Um, as a staff, we felt like we were making some major progress towards uh, getting help. And then uh, the, the current pandemic hit. As a result, we are still uh, working to advocate for uh, some of these control efforts but we also recognize that uh, is, is disappearing very quickly. 
that is uh, my presentation. I've gone as quickly as I can to get through this. I, I appreciate everyone giving me a few minutes of their time. Thanks so much, Brian. Uh, George Bastido is the Director of Emergency Management in Wayne County, and um, you won't find too many slides for George because uh, COVID-19 has taken over his uh, life and job. And George, maybe you want to pick up with that um, concerning your um, sort of competition for your time and energy and resources with respect to this, and then um, getting ready for the impending flooding. Uh, you're in Wayne County, New York, so you're right um, on Long Lake, Ontario, one of the lower Great Lakes. How are you navigating the two uh, urgent matters? George, we can't hear you. George, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. I just made him presenter, but uh, I can't hear him. While we're waiting on George to fix the audio, I just want to make sure everybody is is able to put their questions. You can address them to the organizers. If you have questions about the broader issues around the Great Lakes, uh, including um, strategies to lower the water, which is something we're all concerned about, um, please uh, address those to the organizers and we can get them to uh, the different people. And if you'd like to identify someone specific in your question, go ahead and do so. Yeah, so Jessica, while we're waiting for George, uh, there are a few questions in here already. Do you want to take those now? Yeah, I think we could do that. Um, we have a question to Brian. Uh, Brian, do you have insurance on your marinas and beaches that will help you pay for the repairs? No. Um, that was one of the first questions that we asked to our insurance provider, and they were very quick to point out that uh, we do not have coverage in place to deal with uh, the, the rising water levels. And so how are you paying for these uh, these problems? I mean, you, you talked about 20 million people, uh, $20 million worth of uh, expenses. How are you, how far are you along in finding ways to pay for them? So on the, the marina side of the house, um, we are working with the state of Michigan. They have emergency funding being made available through um, one of uh, one of the waterways uh, grants. Uh, we have an application that uh, we're just wrapping up now. Uh, additionally, we have a, a request for proposal out to local banks where we'll be um, pursuing between uh, a million and a million and a half dollars of emergency repairs. Um, on the other things uh, from uh, the sewer plant to uh, the water filtration plant, we're actively working with the Army Corps of Engineers, trying to um, to work with them on short-term solutions as well as long-term solutions. And then we're doing our very best to advocate through the uh, state of Michigan to try and pick up uh, flooding relief. I, I can tell you that as a city manager, just less than three weeks ago, we we're in regular talks with uh, the state of Michigan and we seem to be making major progress towards securing uh, flood control uh, funding and then uh, the, the COVID situation hits, and it, it's more than likely any of those available dollars through the state of Michigan's budget are, are now gone due to the, uh, the public health crisis. Okay, we're getting a lot of questions, but I just want to see if George Bastido's audio is working. George, do we have you? We do not have you. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question, George. Um, if you'd like to... Um, you can, I will send you my phone number and you can call me and I can put you on my microphone. That might be a fix. Um, while, I, while I'm waiting to do that, let me um, go to another question. And that is from Jeff Wilden. Um, 
oh, Jeff is looking for Brian's contact information. We'll talk, okay, that's another one. We'll go to uh, Alice. Um, what is the reason for the flooding in Michigan? Do they have issues like us on Lake Ontario, RE Plan 14, Plan 2014? Um, Brian, I, I, I don't know if you wanna take that or Ron Wilson, who's also on the, on the call from the Great Lakes Coalition. I think one of the reasons we wanted to have such a broad group of people on this call is because we all are facing the same issues of high water on the Great Lakes more broadly. And so um, we'd like to be able to work together as a bigger group of people to get the water lowered, whether that means political advocacy combined with um, whatever other solutions of personal mitigation are at play. Um, so, um, and actually another person who could answer that question is of course, Natalia, who's really studied this closely. Natalia, do you wanna pick up on the reasons for flooding in Lake Michigan? And um, maybe Brian has some thoughts on that too. Uh, could Brian start? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, it, it's tied to the Great Lakes space and the um, the, the water situation in the uh, city of South Haven. And quite frankly, we're kind of at the uh, the tail end of the train. Um, it, Lake Michigan water levels are being essentially controlled by the, the overall water levels in Great Michigan in the Great Lakes, and um, we're at one of the lower points, so we're seeing it firsthand. Uh, throughout southwest Michigan, we have a variety of homes that are doing emergency repairs to um, to armor their uh, their lake fronts. Um, in Little South Haven area, we've got a variety of homes that are being cut up and actually slid back away from the lake banks. And uh, I can tell you that locally, and this is a relatively small area, um, there have been millions of dollars invested by private homeowners trying to, to protect their property. So what the city of South Haven is facing is in no way unique. It's, it's being felt by both local units of government as well as private property owners. I hope that answers the question. And I would like to add in the last year, uh, the issues experienced in Lake Ontario were due to higher uh, receiving waters from Lake Superior, Michigan, Huron, Erie, and also to um, higher increase in precipitation and snow melt contributing to the issues. Um, and I was just on the other call to um, see what could be the projected Lake Ontario levels um, in a few weeks. And it's very hard to predict the precipitation patterns, of course, but if there were anything like in the last couple of years, then we may see some flooding issues as well. Okay, I'm gonna move on to um, what's being done to take it, what's being done to lower the lakes uh, levels, um, that coming from Terry. I think that's something everybody on the call wants uh, more insight into. Um, Nadia, do you wanna begin with um, talking about the actions that are being taken that you're aware of? Hello, can you hear me? We can now, yep. Yep. Um, so I cannot speak uh, so much as to the actions taken to control lake levels themselves, but I can speak to some of the examples uh, of local communities getting ahead of the springtime flooding right now in Canada. And so some of these examples include municipalities communicating to their residents that they need to find out places where they can evacuate should there be a flood emergency, because in light of the COVID-19 situation, um, emergency shelters may not be uh, assembled. Uh, there are requests to assemble 72-hour emergency kits, especially um, in light of, uh, in Montreal area, that was one of the examples. And uh, some municipalities are providing uh, pre-packaged sandbags to lakefront communities as well. So, um, and they're encouraging residents to ensure that they pick these up in advance of the storms that are coming. These are some of the adaptation actions should there be um, inland flooding uh, this year as well. But maybe other speakers can speak to how the water levels themselves are being controlled. Um, Brian has to jump in a few minutes, so I just wanted to give him a chance to answer uh, anything about uh, property values, because I think that's a great concern for people at the municipal level. And of course, we don't like our own property values going down, but we also know that has a, an impact on what cities can provide in terms of services. 
uh, are you seeing property levels being impacted, Brian? So in, in the South Haven area, um, we've seen an absolute ton of construction uh, with armor stone and other uh, revetment style walls. We anticipate for 2020 as we move into our border review, which is essentially the appeal process on assessed property values, we anticipate that we'll have, uh, it's a bad pun, but a flood of property owners um, appealing their, their values. Um, we did not see it for, for this year, but we anticipate that there will be more and more uh, of those types of, of claims coming in. One more question for you, Brian. Will the city of South Haven have to close the water treatment and sewer plants if they don't get any state or federal money? So we don't anticipate that they will have to close, but we do anticipate that that they're going to be negatively impacted. The most real uh, situation that uh, we anticipate occurring if we don't get flood control efforts in place. Um, our wastewater treatment plants, um, because of the seasonal influx of of, of population. If there were to be a major um, uh, a major storm event in late July, early August, when our population more than doubles, uh, the, the total flow going into the, the sewer plant will force backups. We have roughly 30 lift stations throughout the, uh, the community and uh, sanitary sewer backups will occur at, at some of those lift stations. Um, the bulk of those lift stations are tied directly to either the Black River or a nearby tributary. We will have sanitary sewer flowing into, into open bodies of water if we don't control get controls in place um, in, the, in the coming weeks or months. Wow, that is a very stark picture you've just painted, Brian. Um, Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I do. We do have some more questions, um, one of which is the funding for the 2019 repair fund for St. Lawrence River Lake Ontario is depleted. Neighbors of Watertown is the fund administrator and said New York State said demand exceeded available resources. Any ideas for New York State replenishing the funding? And I guess we should also ask, is there a Michigan equivalent? Is there any uh, if any fund for um, this type of remediation in Michigan. I don't, I don't know if we have Yeah, I go ahead. Wilson. Wilson. I don't think there is one in Michigan. Uh, if it is, it's going to be depleted. Um, and it's certainly going to be taking a huge hit on the, the whole state of Michigan revenues are going to be taking a huge hit due to you know the chloroviridis issue. Um, we're losing tax revenue on uh, income tax, property taxes, and and sales tax revenues. I, I'd like to thank you for for reading my my question. Um, <clears throat> I was not denied, we were not denied, we were just told there's no money for our repairs. And uh, is Michigan, and who, who else is on this? Is everybody in the Great Lakes Basin got the same issues with no funding? Most likely. Yeah, because in 2017, we did get funding and we were able to do quite a repair. And then in 2019, we got other damage and we were looking good until they just said the state said there's no money left so i was i was it was recommended we work with the politicians at the state and federal level put pressure on them any thoughts yes that's very good uh michigan has over the state of michigan has over 150 million dollars worth of infrastructure repairs for its own roads and state parks so there's no money going to be coming this way. Perhaps maybe this would be a good time for uh, Rod to talk about the federal legislation. Oh, I'd be glad to. Um, our industry has worked very closely with uh, the Congress and the staff and, and several leaders' offices during our process of reauthorizing the National Flood Insurance Program, which is currently stalled out. Uh, and has been for a year or so. They don't think we're going to move forward on that. 
legislation until after the next election in November, and COVID has only exacerbated this issue. Um, the missing element in all of this is we know how to fix the buildings and adapt them, whether it be dry flood proofing, barriers, elevation. The problem is the financing. And so uh, our industry has managed to get a novel concept that was developed several years back by a couple of congressional offices uh, to have a revolving loan from the federal government, treasury to FEMA, FEMA to the states, states down to the taxing authorities at the property tax level to provide a revolving loan that would be outside of the mortgage envelope. Uh, it would be attached to the property, allow the property owners to accomplish the projects, finance them, and pay the contractors and designers that are all involved with these projects um, to accomplish the projects, lower their flood risk, lower the flood insurance, and lower all these damages from our flooding that we're getting. Um, and so, uh, we have proposed, our industry has proposed, and we're working with, um, uh, through this organization on the U.S. side, uh, with multiple groups and communities and people, and advocating for taking this revolving loan that we've located within the legislation to be reauthorized for the flood insurance, and putting it into the uh, recovery or um, infrastructure bill that they're all talking about. Uh, because our industry can provide jobs, uh, there's going to be a lot of jobs needed. A lot of people are dislocated out of the tourism industries and, and restaurants and things like that and can work in our industry uh, to learn plumbing, electricity, uh, work on foundations. So we're very excited about the state revolving loan program that's uh, been proposed within the National Flood Insurance Program. We've also shared this legislation with the Intact Center and, and others in the um, Lake Ontario uh, Canadian side uh, to be a possible idea to float to the Canadian government and legislation, uh, the parliament as well. Um, I can share with you that this all came about basically after two years ago when I was invited to represent the industry at a private closed meeting at the US Treasury building where all the major mortgage bankers were sitting around the table. And that's when we learned how really concerned they are about losing over a trillion dollars worth of real estate and values in their mortgages. Uh, the same thing is probably happening in Canada with the banking system and the mortgage system up there. It's a little different, but we think this revolving loan is really a concept that can allow property owners to finance this where they can't find financing currently and not waiting 20 years for a grant because then the flood insurance is going to have knocked them down in values. And we're just very excited that this may be taken up as part of the COVID-19 recovery funding pro programs, because it'll take almost a year to put it in place with the administrative rules and all the process of getting something new started. But the banks have committed in America to fund this program beyond just what the government's going to put in there because they're sitting on all these mortgages. So we're excited about the state revolving loan. And I would just add that um, obviously there's money flowing with COVID-19. And so one of the things that uh, the Great Lakes Coalition and the Coalition to Fight Plan 2014, which is made up of Save Our Sodas, Lake Ontario, St. Lawrence, River Alliance, and the United Shoreline Ontario, um, we're looking on the U.S. side to see if there are ways to um, find mitigation efforts that can go into any of the bills that are being proposed. Um, most recently, we've learned that the next bill will more likely be uh, medical in nature, but there should be an infrastructure bill at some point down the road, and that could give communities an opportunity to fund specific projects. So in your uh, municipality, you may wanna think about um, ways to support that effort or ask your public officials about that. If you're ready to get involved, this is exactly the right time that we need you. And I know Ron Wilson and the Great Lakes Coalition are also looking into some things that um, can be part of the solution. And certainly Rod Scott would also welcome your support for uh, the existing legislation. Um, he has that legislation, so we can make that proposed draft available to any of you who are interested in looking at it. Um, we can also make that part of the presentation materials uh, that we put up on uh, the websites of the Great Lakes Coalition, Save Our Sodas, and the Lake Ontario St. Lawrence River Association, which will happen at the completion of this uh, of this call. Um, Jeff Wilden has a question about. Um, oh, excuse me, George Bastido, I believe, is back up and running. 
So if you have questions related to New York State, I know a number of you are in the Wayne County area or part of the Lake Ontario um, affected areas. George, do we have you now? I think so. Can everybody hear me oh, this time? Excellent. Okay, excellent. <laughs> George, I wanted to follow up on the question we had posed to you initially. Um, you are in the middle and the thick of responding to COVID-19, and there are a lot of older residents in the area that you operate. How is COVID-19, how much of a distraction is it from the flood preparations? Were you able to get ahead of the pandemic in terms of uh, having thought about flood preparations because you've been through it before prior to COVID-19. How are you balancing these two competing priorities? Well, New York State was very good about uh, pre-building sandbags earlier this year. I don't think we have enough yet, but they did a great job with that. Now the real challenge is going to be making sure we have A, enough sandbags, and B, what do we do to get them in position with the social distancing challenges that COVID-19 presents. We're not quite past that. We know there's alternatives to sandbags out there. We haven't had a lot of time to evaluate them because we have been spread so thin. I know the state's somewhat more familiar with them than we are, but uh, time is running short. I think within the next couple of weeks, we're gonna have a problem. Sodas Point is ground zero uh, for the south side of Lake Ontario as far as flooding is concerned. At 248, uh, it's basically starting to get underwater. That includes the roads, the ground, the uh, houses that have not been elevated yet. Over the last couple of years, they've done a great job of you know, beginning to elevate houses, do some other things, sea walls, but we're not there yet. We still need a couple of more years to get that done uh, if this is gonna continue. I would like to say that uh, if people are gonna take things on their own, to make sure they stay safe, especially through this holiday season. You know, there's no thing that's worth somebody's health and safety. So keep the social distancing up. We're not out of this yet. Uh, New York is in the thick of it. Wayne County, we've been pretty lucky. Uh, we've had a limited number of cases, but there's other counties very close to us that have had many more cases. Uh, and uh, we're gonna keep doing what we need to do to keep everybody safe. George and maybe Diane Devlin um, from Public Health can also weigh in on this. There, there are, there is bacteria, right, that can stay on the sandbag. So, are you even recommending the use of sandbags at all at this point? In other words, the sandbags could be a transmitter of the, the virus, certainly, not just. Well, yeah, of course, are. you know, bacteria, sandbags, two different things. Um, I don't have a good answer for that right now. I'd have to dig into it. If you're talking about if people are forming a fire line person to person to, to uh, a fire brigade to get them in position, yeah, that could be an issue. You know, people are going to cough, they're going to sweat, they're going to breathe. If what And the concerning thing is you can be, be contagious for four to five days before symptoms even show up. So you could be out there trying to help, trying to be a good Samaritan, and you're making people around you sick. I don't know if we have Diane on the line, but do you have anything to add, Diane? Have you been affected at all, George, since we've got you um, on the, the property value side in terms of the, the resources you can draw from, the tax base you can draw from to pay for the resources you need to protect the community? Uh, that is probably above my pay grade to answer that one. Uh, we've watched the property values. It is a significant amount of the property values of Wayne County, the, uh, the Lakeshore area. We're very concerned about that, not just property values, but also the tax base. Uh, you know, so does point, they sell million dollar yachts up there. That's a, that's a nice kick for the, uh, the sales tax on that. And they have several very popular restaurants up there that are packed all summer long. Uh, along with all the other uh, small businesses and shops there that, that generate revenue for the benefit of the county and the state. So, yeah, it's going to sting if we can't get those open this year. Okay, and of course, we have a reminder from Ron Wilson that you should still wear gloves and masks when working on sandbagging. Certainly, that's the case. And I do believe, Rod Scott, do you have some vendors on your Flood Mitigation Industry Association website 
that people can become familiar with if they want alternatives to sandbags? Well, thanks, Jessica. Actually, uh, we have been working on a project with the Intact Center uh, to uh, gather uh, as, as many of the entrepreneurial companies that are manufacturing products that are in this flood defense arena, uh, gates and closures for buildings, uh, which are more the dry flood proofing as opposed to the site protection. And and we're uh, my understanding is it's just about to be released from the Intact Center, um, and, and it's that cooperative effort, private industry, uh, colleges, higher institutions like this that we're looking for working together. So uh, I do have a copy of that if somebody needs it right away and is not needing to wait until, and especially on the U.S. side because you know, we're still two separate countries, but we do have that list and I can make that available to you, Jessica, or yeah, to um, individual to communities. Yeah. Yep. I'd yep. love to post it. We'll post it at the same place with the presentation materials that you provided. That would be great. Um, Natalia and people. Rod are, are working on a certification process because there's so many options out there, right? Um, what are some things that uh, you, in conjunction with Rod, are looking at to help people make these decisions? Well, I think like Rod mentioned, there are so many products out there and it's hard to figure out which one uh, to use in which environment. The product that I referenced in my presentation slides for, that TrioVest uh, has invested in, um, that is a temporary uh, barrier that can be reused multiple times following flood events as opposed to sandbags that become contaminated waste manufactured by a mega secure um, facility in Quebec, it's called Watergate, and I mentioned it takes um, about 50 minutes to set up by a staff of four people who have been trained and experienced with how to set up this barrier, protecting five city blocks um, uh, with heights of the barrier going from 0 0.6 meters to 1.5 meters. But this is just one example of many barriers that are available um, from my experience, while there are many products, um, a better analysis of the pros and cons and optimal applications is required. Um, and uh, to your point, uh, Jessica, there are talks right now in Canada whether we need to create uh, a national standard that would spell out available products, uh, that their best uh, use applications. Um, and uh, considerations for municipalities and homeowners as they're applying, but it doesn't exist yet. Okay, and if I understand correctly, it does not exist in the United States at all. And Rod, are you aware of any preparations at the at the regulatory level to come up with a certification process for those products? Yes, actually, actually uh, we are a couple of head, uh, years ahead of the rest of the world, uh, but not just the US, actually, um, there is a standard now that's been developed by the international engineering uh, community uh, for um, barriers. Um, the international insurance company, FM Global, that insures large corporations and their sites and facilities, uh, has partnered with the US Army Corps of Engineers and the Association of State Floodplain Managers, which uh, is also active up in Canada and has memberships all over the world now as we get more and more management in our floodplains in other countries. Uh, so they actually have an active testing and certification program. Those standards are now published. Um, I believe it's floodbarrier.org and uh, local or other countries can actually adopt these standards and test their own products in those countries. I know that the University of Hull in England is actually looking at adopting these standards and testing products that are being developed over on, in the British Isles. Uh, we encourage uh, testing of products and a international certification of those products because with the demand comes innovation and innovation needs some kind of qualification and certification so that it meets standards so that people can depend on those standards um, we have a lot of products out there that haven't been certified yet, and there a lot of them are going through this process uh, that are manufactured in multiple countries. Uh, but you can now do the testing in your own country. Could I ask if you could put that website um, on the chat for everybody to look at when you oh, get a chance? While you're going, okay, yeah, it has it there. Um, and Rod, may I just follow up on the, uh, on that point? From my understanding. Um, 
it, it, the testing that you're referring to is the product testing. Are you aware of any certification training um, that comes along with it to ensure that the barriers are installed properly? Um, because as, as we're all aware that there's such a significant staff turnover um, and absolutely you need required personnel to assemble these barriers. Yeah, other than the instructions that come with the barrier systems and or a first time training when those are deployed that uh, but we what we do have now. Um, so the answer to your question is um, no, there is no certification for installation of these barrier systems. And I think that relates back to the fact that we don't have a global certification of the products themselves yet, which should include an installation certification, in my opinion. Uh, I'm not involved with that testing, so I don't know all of the details of that testing other than it's happening now. Uh, and it's only been a couple of years. Um, one of the things that has evolved with this demand for these systems is emergency deployment companies, which are actually um, uh, becoming a part of our flood mitigation industry to meet these demands because communities and their public works offices and their engineering staffs and and uh, fire uh, emergency services people who would be responsible for setting these up very often have their hands completely overwhelmed and, and full of other work as these disasters start unfolding. So um, there's actually emergency deployment companies that will supply the products or come in and install those products that this community may have warehoused uh, that they purchased like the Tiger Dam facilities in South Haven that he was referring to uh, for their site protection, they may have those stored, but instead of them deploying them, they would hire under contract. Uh, for in America, before the hurricane season starts, communities are supposed to have their debris removal contractors under contract uh, in order to get reimbursed by FEMA. In, uh, in the case of flood fighting products, we've never had that as a process and uh, our industry is now in conversation with several former FEMA executives who are looking at the development of an RFP for communities to use to get that in place so that they can get a company to come deploy uh, either products or that they don't own or products that they have in storage so that their staff can be focused on logistics of the disaster and managing all of that as opposed to trying to set up barriers as the water's coming at them. Does that help? Thank you. I also have a couple questions from Bill Beck who asks about um, media, uh, can all available outflows be open to help mediate levels of Great Lakes? Um, he also asked earlier, um, are the only outflows from the Great Lakes the St. Lawrence River and Chicago River? Isn't there a potential outflow to the Hudson Bay that has been stopped? Ron Wilson, do you want to take that one? Or Bernie, you have some insight into the, that issue as well. I'll defer to Bernie. Uh, I don't have, we, we've been talking about going down the Erie Canal or other sources to the Hudson Bay, but, um, or to New York Bay, but we have not, seen anything in writing yeah so the the only thing that i'm aware of are the diversions that are into lake superior at the moment uh, which are there for power generation you know, those have been shut down in the past and uh impact on those are somewhere on the order of 0.2 to 0.3 feet at least from the analysis i've seen uh, so that's pretty realistic other ways of getting water out of lake erie uh, i know on the conversation yesterday that came up as well uh, I'm not, you really can't use, uh, at least not to my knowledge, you can't use the Erie Canal because that flows uphill for a portion of it. It's generally downhill, but there is an uphill portion. Uh, the only way you could really do that is by uh, putting in a lift uh, from Oswego uh, to west of, of Utica, uh, or east of Utica rather, and then do the entire downhill portion there, but that infrastructure is not in place. So no, there's really no good clean way of getting water out other than uh, through the St. Lawrence. And with the Chicago uh, River, you would have to go through the U.S. Supreme Court to make a change in the amount of water that goes through there. Well, yeah, it's by national anyway. Well, right, so that's still on the uh, internationally. 
if it if it still has to get through the U.S. Supreme Court. So the IJC would yes. have to request the U.S. Supreme Court to take action. And the Canadians would have to agree to it, yes. George, I, I'm still curious uh, because of the intersection of COVID-19 and, and, the, and the pending flooding, um, if you're getting any additional support or guidance from the state or federal uh, government on how to prioritize uh, other than the advice that we've already extended to people? Well, life safety comes first in any emergency or disaster. So it's all a life, life safety, both of the general public and the emergency responders, and then protection of property and assets. Uh, beyond that, it's just everything you've already heard. Um, I wonder too, something that uh, Sarah Delicate of the United Shoreline Ontario group in Bowmanville has been doing is surveying both sides of Lake Ontario on their social vulnerability so that you know the ages of the people that live along your lake. Um, and that obviously has a factor in this particular situation because age is a factor in susceptibility to COVID-19. Is that something that you, do you get any kind of that information as an emergency responder from any of these sources? Or is that a function that some of these groups like Sarah's uh, and these volunteer associations could play just to help you understand your, your um, the, the public that you serve a little bit better? That would certainly help. You know, we're also interested in that knowledge. But at this time, everybody's spread so thin, and as far as sandbags are concerned, social distancing is still going to be a challenge this year. And, and none of the individual homeowners seem to want to spend any money on their own. Some do, I shouldn't say nobody. But uh, when we get into the elderly, very often they're retaining their property. It's you know second, third generation, saving it for their children, and they're really trying not to make any investments if they absolutely don't have to. We respect that. I get it totally. But uh, we're in really uncharted territory right now with uh, the COVID-19 kicking into it uh, as well. Do you anticipate you're going to lose properties just because when people have to make the choice, they're going to have to choose life over property? Uh, there could be structures that are lost. I mean, if, if it floods, if this is a record flood year, we could lose properties. Uh, or at least have some serious rehab that's necessary after the, the flooding subsides. Uh, time will tell whether that happens or not. And one other question, sorry, George, <laughs> you're my target today. Um, the, and I may have more after this, but the, the issue with uh, how uh, the state fund was run was the ready funding. I don't think Michigan has a, an equivalent, um, but that came through the state. Um, if, if somebody else had a question about accessing funding as a personal home for, homeowner, if you are not in a floodplain, is it the case that you can't access FEMA funds for mitigation or for prevention? Well, the Ready program, there was a, originally designed to be just for uh, public infrastructure, but then the governor or the uh, the state decided to take a slice of that and fund some personal properties similar to what they did in 2017 when we had the flooding. I can't speak to it a lot more than that. I know that there was some money out there. The application process is in process right now. Uh, it's up to $50,000 if it's the primary residence. Yeah, but we have people certainly on this call that have been turned down for that. So I'm just wondering, I mean, maybe this gets back to questions that have already been asked and are difficult to answer. But the, the, the streams of revenue that could be made available, do they have to come from the state as opposed to the federal government when it comes to reimbursing homeowners for prevention or mitigation? Well, certainly as part of a disaster, the federal government has the ability to provide um, financial assistance. It's usually in the, the form of low interest loans to private residences if they're unable to, to secure funding from their uh, regular commercial lenders for one reason or another. That's a, a discussion that could take an hour of its own right. It doesn't happen very often, but uh, and I'm not sure if it's gonna happen this time or not. Should we That's be lobbying the federal government for a disaster declaration? I know, I think some parts of Michigan have done that, right? 
the disaster declaration for the coronavirus already exists as far as the uh, the Lake Ontario flooding we're kind of early for that to happen Jessica Brian yes this is some and Brian Mankel how are you today oh hi hi just just to go back to the ready money um there was 300 million dollars put into that pot and several of us uh, assembly members along the lake met with the governor and the governor's office asking him to divert some of that money to the, the property owners. So I think he diverted about $20 million to the property owners for their homes. Um, we'll be doing some follow-ups here in the next few weeks with that. So to let you know that we're out there and um, we'll, we'll be making an announcement here pretty quick from the assembly side, probably within the next day or so too, um, moving forward for um, looking at the lake levels along the lake. When you say announcement, do you mean there might be more money available for homeowners? No, just just a task force that we're going to put together again, now that we're involved into uh, the high water again, making sure we're doing everything we can from the state side and from the assembly side, because most of us have, uh, I have three counties in my district, of course, uh, Wayne, uh, uh, Cuga and Oswego uh, counties. So making sure that we're doing everything for these property owners and with the COVID-19 crisis going on, we need to all work together and offering more help to our emergency management offices as we move forward. Well, I think they could use money, Assemblyman. <laughs> a lot of people turned down, um, but it makes sense because I think we had, what makes sense is, is that you've, you've just told us that it's not the full 300 million that's been spent in this way. It's a fraction of that that was put towards homeowners. Is that correct? Yeah, about 20 million of the 300 million went to homeowners. The other issue is with the water being so high so long, a lot of the businesses and property owners can't do anything yet until that water goes down. So I'm, my job is to make sure we secure that money, keep that money flowing, and I'll be working at that. All right, let us know how we can help. Absolutely, and thank how, you. How we can get behind something that needs a, a push. Um, I think we have one more question from Bill Beck. Uh, thanks, Assemblyman. Uh, Southwest America is in drought and the Great Lakes has an overabundance of water. How feasible is solving the drought problem with an, our excess water? Does it amount to a 21st century TVA program of water diversion? This is something that Ron Wilson, I think, has uh, floated, right, Ron? Yes, I floated that. Um, it was discussed back in 86 and it didn't go very far because people didn't want to uh, send any water out there because then we would lose the economic development opportunity of making use of the water. Um, still, if this is climate change, we should be taking a, a better look at that. And I was told that opening up the Chicago River would be better than shipping it out west on a cost-effective basis. Um, but then you still have people down water downstream that will get flooded. Uh, so there is some options. I know in 86, there is discussion of, of taking over the Detroit Edison company um, coal slurry that dumps into uh, Superior, Wisconsin and send water out west. But nothing has really been done with that since that, since 86. And I've been encouraging the state to uh, take a look at that and do the research on those types of alternatives. But still, you'll have the environmentalists and others saying not to send water out because then they'll just take it. What happens if we get, like in 2013, when it was the lowest level? I said, well, we could put stipulations by the, you know, the IJCs that in Lake Michigan, we go down two feet above normal. Uh, or one foot above normal is is as far down we go. And so that would be essentially two feet of water being pumped out of uh, the states, um, the Great Lakes states. Uh, but I've not heard many people doing any official studies on that at this point in time. All right, we're gonna wrap this up as soon as I get some presenter status back. Um, thanks everybody for joining us. We had a great showing. I did want to just bring you through this slide. Um, Bernie, do I? Everybody see this Earth Day slide? Nope. Nope, they don't. Okay, let me get that up there for you. Here we go. Just made your presenter. Yep, there we go. So, um, 
What I'm showing you here is um, something we'd love to have everybody's participation in. Um, we're holding an Earth Day fundraiser social media storm. It's pretty light on uh, the lifting. We'd just love to have you share um, these links as well as any personal stories that you've had with flooding or erosion and what the Great Lakes that you live and work alongside mean to you. Um, also spread the word about our uh, various associations working on this problem. Again, we're trying to form a broader coalition um, to work on these problems with our elected officials. You can ask local businesses to share fundraiser information and specifically the fundraiser information that we're providing here is going to um, working with the Washington law firm uh, to work with our elected officials at the federal level uh, on these problems. Um, and of course, we'd love to have you reach out to neighbors and share your personal story on your social media and share everything you can um, from our uh, provided websites. Uh, and uh, and um, we can use the hashtag uh, fight for the future because this is certainly something that is important to everyone's future. But again, would be happy to have your participation on Earth Day, which is April 22nd. Um, we're going to do this social media storm and have you uh, encourage you all to uh, share all this information on your social media and share your stories as well, because uh, those are very compelling. I know many of you have a lot of very important stories. Um, again, this will be posted on your uh, on losra.org and on uh, greatlakescoalition.org. Um, and uh, we'll give you all the slides there. If you need it by email, we'll also be sending it that way. But we'd love, we really appreciate you all joining us for this session. Uh, and uh, let me just give you our end, our ending frame here, so you can have all the websites to link to uh, for the, oops, for the end session here. We really appreciate you guys all joining us today. And uh, this will also be available for viewing again. It has been recording, recorded, uh, and it will be available on greatlakescoalition.org and on um, losra.org at the conclusion of this webinar. Thanks again, everybody. You got to stop recording. Yep. Put these things back together.